Welcome to the Bombay Bar podcast, a show where we share the rich history of the Bombay Bar Association through our esteemed members past and present. I am Vishal Kanade, Honorary Secretary of the Bombay Bar Association, and I will be your host on this episode. Today we are honored to have with us Mr. Ravi Kadam, Senior Advocate and former Advocate General for the State of Maharashtra, and Dr. Birendra Saraf, Senior Advocate and the present Advocate General for the State of Maharashtra. On a personal note, it's an absolute privilege to be part of this show. and to interview both mr kadam and dr saraf because i had begun my journey in law by joining the chambers of mr kadam in 2006 and dr saraf was a senior chamber colleague i am excited for young lawyers at the bar to witness a different episode of the bombay bar podcast that looks at the journey of not just one but two advocate generals mr kadam and dr saraf our viewers would love to know about your journey how it all began and how you decided to become a lawyer so we'll begin with our questions on account of seniority i'll have to ask mr kadam first <laughs> always always, <laughs> always. Uh, mr kadam your family comes from satara your father is a first was a first time first generation lawyer a barrister and a government pleader can you tell us something about him and how he joined the profession i think my father was uh, brought up in satara in a village and i think for school at that time he had to go to satara town after that the kolapur maharaja used to run a scheme in uh, rajaram college is college in kolapur for good students and my father went there and did his undergrad i think and after that it was one of the things so either he became a doctor or a lawyer so he chose to be a lawyer and they even had a scheme where they would have low interest loans for farmers children which my father was to study abroad and he got that and uh, got that loan and went to the uk and studied wow. for bar exams wow. you had mentioned to us while we were in chambers that even from your student days you were a voracious reader can you tell us what sparked this interest in reading and literature which my dad did because i think when i was about 10 years old he started taking me and my older brother to the british council library and i started reading and i got very hooked on reading and when you read a lot you write better also so in school i started doing well in english and then my father introduced me to naipaul's books which i thought now in retrospect was too early but the book which fascinated me at that time and still does of course is a house for mr biswas which is one of naipaul's yeah. early books and then i got just hooked on to reading and then slowly into writing for the school and then in college also we have been told on good authority that while you were a student uh, instead of answering a regulation question in your english examination you instead wrote a long essay on religion in the 21st century uh, is that true yeah. and what was the reaction of your teacher well actually when i joined sydenham college in the first terms i just didn't go into the class at all so when the exam came i knew nothing so the english book also i had not read any of them so i had nothing to do and i didn't want to walk out of the class uh, you know exam hall so i sat and i wrote this said write an essay on a topic of your choice which was like 10 marks out of 100 instead i spent the entire 2 hours or whatever it was just writing that one essay of over 22 23 pages and i left it at that i didn't think you know i thought it would be just junked the we had a english teacher i think her name was mrs hemadi and another lady who was also very good called mrs kazi so after we came back after diwali term and the marks were being given out first they called out the best students and then they called out my name and i thought i'm going to really get it in the neck because of you know this mischief i had played instead the teacher called me on stage and said you must commend this boy because obviously he didn't know what he was expected to know but he wrote a superb essay wow and then you know i got into the english society and writing for the college through that so we had great teachers you know who appreciated right. this sort of thing which was wonderful dr saraf uh, your family hails from guwahati your father also was a first generation lawyer uh, authority on income tax a former chief justice of jammu and kashmir high court and a doctorate uh, can you tell us something about him and his journey in the profession uh, vishal my family originally came from a very humble background so my grandfather had a very small uh, shop where they used to sell cloth pieces and my father 
they used to have a big joint family where they used to all stay together, a huge family in a small house. That house even lacked the basic amenities. So my father used to sell clothes along with my grandfather in the shop. And he was the first person in the family who had formal education. None before him had any kind of formal education. And while studying like this, he topped the university every time. In every exam, he topped the university. So it was basically his dream that made, took him ahead. And he studied very hard way. He used to ride a bicycle for almost 15, 20 kilometers to go and give lecture in a university. So it is uh, his journey was one of struggle. And I see many others like him of the earlier generation who went through such struggle. In 1992, you moved from Guwahati to Mumbai. Yes. Uh, what were those initial years like? How did you adjust to a city like Bombay? Well, it was a struggle like any other small town boy coming to a big city. You take time to adjust to the ways here. Bombay people are very welcoming and very warm, but it takes time to break the ice and to learn the ways. I made some very good friends in government law college and they familiarized me a lot about Bombay. I used to make four pass and they used to correct me. Of course, after having a hearty laugh at my expense, and I learned a lot by observing. I joined Gagrat and Company, which also gave me a very a, a good exposure to Mumbai. But at the same time, there were certain values of a small town, which I continue to keep. So while I accepted Mumbai fully, I also kept in me that little small town boy culture, which I cherish and which I enjoy. So we see that uh, both of you, uh, came from a legal background. You had a background in the profession. Uh, what made you choose law as a profession? And did you at any point of time have any alternate profession in mind, uh, Mr. Kadap? Actually, when I was in Sydney College, I only knew what I don't want to do. <laughs> so I didn't want to be a CA, which most uh, Sydney College being a commerce college student did. I didn't want to do MBA, which the remaining students did. So there was nothing else really to do except to join law. And that's one way to continue. So it was a good thing that I didn't do CA and MBA because I wasn't suited for it. Then after, of course, when law college, I never had any other thoughts. I had a thought while studying law. I was still not sure that I would become a lawyer. I thought I would become a journalist. I wanted to be independent, basically, not be employed anywhere. So I thought maybe if I become a freelance journalist, I used to read a lot of magazines and books where I used to read about freelance writers. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe I can become a freelance writer. And then, of course, I, I joined as, like Bire and I joined a law firm whilst in college. We got this morning college. Right. So during the day, I started hanging out in the court and joined a law firm. So after some time of being in that law firm in the last year, then I joined Diresh Vyas. And I worked with him for about two years. He was an eminent uh, tax, tax lawyer. Uh, lawyer, senior counsel. And he was a co-author of third or fourth edition of Kanga and Palkiwala. Yeah. Or the co-editor, rather. And then somehow I found even tax practice, you know, was very restricting because it was just income tax. And so then I used to see other counsel doing, you know, kind of varied work. And then gradually I drifted towards where I finally ended up. That's how it started. Right. Dr. Saraf? I was told that the elder son will become an advocate and I should become a doctor. And I worked on that as it went. So I worked, I took biology in 11th and 12th, ready to become a doctor. And I used to have a big poster in my room called Aim for Aims and all that. I worked on all that. But at some stage, I realized that the excitement of the legal profession, which I had seen my father do was far more exciting for me than the medical profession. So one good morning, I went to my father and with a great deal of fear, told him that I don't think I can become a doctor and I would like to do law. So he told me only one thing. He said, you must make one promise to me that you should get good marks so that people don't think that you couldn't study medical and you didn't get admission and therefore no. you shifted to law. So I kept my promise and he kept his. Both of you are alumni of Government Law College. Uh, in fact, uh, my first interaction with both of you as a law student was as a GLC, Moot Court Association member, inviting both of you for Moot Courts. 
Mr. Uh, Kadam, can you tell us what do you remember the most about your days in Government Law College and uh, did it have an impact in terms of your career or your perspective? But one thing I must tell you about Law College is it had a fantastic library of biographies and autobiographies of great lawyers and great judges and some volumes of the complete length and text of a trial. So, so many major trials of the you know early 20th century, late 19th century. So, those three, four books or three, four rather book uh, uh, cases, I read all of those book cases every year again and again. So that I got this, the romance of the law is what got into me by reading those books. Some of these great lawyers, Edmund Marshall Hall, Erskine, yeah. all the great lawyers of the English bar. And then the reading about Indian lawyers, how they came. Even I read about Dr. Ambedkar and his struggles and how, of course, in, in as a professional, etc. So that romance of the law is what brought me into the practice of the law. I had this romantic version which, of course, later proved to be <laughs> so just a version. But anyway, I, that's how I got into... That was my most abiding and even today abiding memory of law college or two places. One is the canteen and the other is the library. I didn't go to class much. Dr. Saraf, uh, what do you remember most about GLC now in today's day? Uh, my experience was quite similar to what Ravi said. I was also in the morning batch and uh, I used to work during the day. But I used to diligently go to college every morning and sit in the canteen and have a good time there. And I used to also access the library for around 40, 45 days before the exams, during which time I used to not just study for the exams, but I used to read beyond that. And uh, that was a good period of study in the college. And of course, I met my wife there. So that was the high point of the government <laughs> law college. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> We'll now move to practice on the original side and for some of our viewers and students uh, in the Bombay High Court, we have practice on the appellate side and on the original side, you would either work in a law firm as an associate or join the bar as a counsel. Over the years, uh, the composition of the original side bar has changed to a large extent. What was it like when you joined the bar, Mr. Kadam? The bar on the original side was a Gujarati speaking bar which was pretty and uh, sound unusual today. It was entirely a Gujarati speaking bar. So whether the council was Gujarati or non-Gujarati, there were some, very few, there were some. They also spoke in Gujarati. So I had to firstly learn to speak in Gujarati, which I was good in languages. So I picked it up within few months. So I had to learn to speak in Gujarati to be able to interact with the briefing solicitors, their managing clerks, etc. The work was mostly property, real estate and, you know, land cases on the original side, builder cases. And initially there used to be some kind of film cases, but not film copyright, but more of film disputes, you know. I had to uh, pick up work by learning from others who would converse. Even the clients spoke Gujarati. So I think it was just kind of... It's default setting, which you had to adjust to, which I did. Right. Dr. Saraf? Vishal, my recollection of uh, the time when I started practice was that the original side was dominated mainly by law firms. And when I joined, I found it was a bit of a clannish bar where every law firm would have their own favorite counsel. And it was very difficult to make an opening into firms which already had its set of favorite counsel. I don't find fault maybe because they had worked with them over the years and had a comfort level. But when I see the bar now, the original side bar now, the composition has changed. There are a lot of individual advocates. Mm. There are young lawyers who have shifted practice into the original side who are also filing. And that has brought the original side a little more openness, I would say. And that has helped the original side. In fact, uh Taking a cue from what uh, Mr. Kadam said, in fact, I remember this day very vividly where both uh, Biren sir and me were talking in Gujarati about some matter and you came in and you said, this is what original side does to you, a Marwadi and Maharashtan talking in Gujarati. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Moving ahead, uh, both of you indicated uh, you had worked in law firm. 
for students who are in their final year or who are studying and aspiring to join the original side would you suggest or would you think that a stint in a law firm or a solicitor's firm would be a good way to go about it if the ultimate choice is to get into counsel practice later in point in time a stint with any lawyer who's practicing in the courts is an absolute essential before you join the bar so a law firm of course if they have a good litigation department good meaning having not good qualitatively all are good most of them are very good but who have good volume of uh, litigation work if you join there and if they have variety to add then it's the best grounding getting out of college and straight into counsel practice can lead to frustration and also your inadequacies get exposed very early so it's better that you learn a bit maybe 2 years 3 years whatever you can you know do at least 2 3 years and then become a counsel that will really make a difference dr saraf i also believe that a stint in the law firm is very helpful mm. i worked for 3 years while i was studying law full time in gagrat and company and that helped me immensely also working in a law firm gets you the opportunity to work with different lawyers and different counsel so you see this way of functioning of different lawyers you can pick up the positives of each one of them and there is a great deal to learn on a diverse uh, nature of work so a stint in the law firms is always very helpful right we'll now move on to uh, the time when you joined your respective chambers and i vividly remember my first day in ravi sir's chamber it was advocate general office bustling with activity hectic and frantic meetings around so i entered the chamber and ravi sir said just follow me and observe and i was later greeted by dr saraf who asked if i had got my sanad and i told him yes i have got my sanad and he said good now like us you will be unleashed on the society <laughs> <laughs> and mr ashish kamat senior advocate who just kept glaring at me later he told me that he thought i was a nerd and I, he would never get along with me but <laughs> uh those are those wonderful days when you join and you have very vivid memories uh, mr kadam what are your memories of your early days in the legendary mr j m mehta's chamber oh it was a fantastic chamber and i was very very fortunate i am still fortunate to have trained in that chamber you had j m mehta who was the uh, one of the leaders of the bar absolute lion and uh, he headed our chambers and you had after him his nephew uh, girish tesai was there and he was a wonderful wonderful uh, human being and really helped all of us a lot and he must have been just 10 years younger than jay or probably less then you had uh, tuljapurkars you had a lot of wonderful guys and all very very competent lawyers so in fact because jay met was such a big name and so much older than us most of my work i you know I, there was a lot of trepidation of asking him questions which i did of course but very rarely i would rather ask someone who was just immediately senior to me which i think happens in all chambers right. and so i used to approach uh, videndra tuljapurkar and he used to guide me the most but i had a fantastic chamber and we had a great time of you know it was from all ages and the whole bunch of us who are you know in the 20 uh, like like in their 20s and early 30s and there are some seniors so we had kind of two groups who is to have wonderful types and great very competent people and one most important thing which i learned in that chamber was the importance of utilizing the time during the day effectively neither my senior nor his other juniors wasted any time we should come to they should come to court say by 10 30 or so and court is to start at 11, 11. and except maybe for a lunch break they didn't go anywhere except the court room and the library you know and they would finish work by 7 o'clock because they didn't waste any time during the day so with dictating pleadings and everything they would still be able to finish 7 and go home by 7 7:30 wow. so that's one thing i learned from them you had mentioned that uh, you had also worked as the additional government pleader in early days of your career what was that experience like uh, so i didn't have much work uh, when i started 
So after a few years, I became eligible uh, to apply for honorary assistant government pleader. After seven years of practice, they, you couldn't become an assistant government pleader. You needed 10 years. But you could become an honorary assistant government pleader. So I applied for that and I got that job. I mean, so I did it side by side with my original side practice. And I consciously took assistant government pleader appellate side, which would not clash with my original yes, side work. And I wouldn't be seen as a government pleader in the original <laughs> side court halls. So that was the kind of thing I thought about and I implemented. But having joined that office, there were, uh, we had a very good government pleader called Mr. Page. And he soon developed confidence in me. I started doing all the major civil cases, which he used to handle. He started wow. passing on to me at that time. And I got an opportunity to appear against all the doyens of the appellate side bar, which yeah. I would have never got. You know, all yeah. the leading lawyers, and they also were very nice to me. You know, so I got that opportunity. And a lot of judges also got to see that, you know, as a young lawyer, he's somebody who's trying hard. So that got me a lot of experience and a lot of exposure. So it stood me in good stead when I did finally get work on the original okay. side. Dr. Saraf, uh, you had joined the chambers of Dr. D.Y. Chandrachut, our present Chief Justice of India. What are your memories of uh, joining his chamber, those initial days? Vishal, uh, the chambers of uh, Dr. Chandrachut was very different from the chambers of Mr. J.I. Mehta. As he said, when he joined Mr. J.I. Mehta, he was a stalwart, very senior a person. But when I joined uh, Dr. Chandrachud, he was 36 years of age. So it was a very young chamber. And uh, he was a very uh, fun-loving person. So we used to go to his house. It was a chamber which functioned in a different manner. So we used to go to his residence at around 7.30 in the morning. And we used to work there for two hours. And thereafter, we used to come in the car with him in which he used to play some music and we used to all enjoy. He used to have around 15 to 20 matters every day. And my job was to try and take care of those matters, you know, get, keep them back, adjourn them. But the quality about him was as soon as he reached back the chamber, he carried no stress of the matters with him. And he used to be an entirely different person, a very fun loving person. I'll uh, narrate one incidents, uh, incident with you where he used to, uh, there used to be a toilet where there used to be very little water supply. So he used to keep a water spray in the fridge with him, which he used to spray on his face uh, to freshen up. So he used to hide behind the door and spray us with that water from his water <laughs> spray. And very soon, we used to take that over and we used to be spraying water on one another's face. So it was a chamber which was to this extent casual and fun. But at the same time, we did a lot of work. And uh, I had a lot of colleagues. We were all young. We were all struggling. We used to share our frustrations at times, take it out on one another. But I guess uh, that's what bonded us together. And by God's grace, I think we all did well. Right. After Justice Chandrachud was elevated as a judge of the Bombay High Court, you joined the chambers of Mr. Kadam. Uh, what was the difference that you noticed when you joined Mr. Kadam's chambers? It was a completely different experience. Dr. Chandrachud never reprimanded you or said anything uh, directly. He would correct my whole draft, almost rewrite it and return it back and say, thank you, Viren. Or if I had missed something in a research, the next morning, he would find out four judgments on the point and just tell me, just look at these judgments and they would be bang on the point where I had <laughs> failed to find anything and I would go hiding for two days. Mr. Kadam, on the other hand, was very straightforward. He minced no words and he gave you a piece of his mind when you went wrong. They were in very few words, but it was very straightforward. But both these experiences helped me evolve. Mr. Kadam gave me the strength to face adversity and he taught me how to, you know, face different difficult situations. And that learning was very different. As I would, uh, as a comparison say, while uh, Dr. Chandrachud was a soft, long medication, Mr. Kadam's was a one hard injection, <laughs> which <laughs> told you what he wanted to tell you. Uh, Mr. Kadam, is there a principle of practice within Mr. J.I. Mehta's chamber that you have carried forward into yours? To take head on what are the issues that the other side, I used to find that Mr. J.I. Mehta, when he used to argue, 
and many of his juniors do that he would cover not only his own case but every single conceivable defense that could be taken up he would cover in his opening argument so right. the judge would know the answers to the other side's arguments even before he stood up and the judge would then say no but you are <laughs> what you're saying this is the answer so that's something i learned from him uh, the and the other principle was that uh, to be absolutely candid in court not not to keep anything back that is one basic thing he taught us is there sir of any uh, principle or practice of either justice chandrachud or mr karam that you have carried in your chambers we shall both of them had one common quality that there should be no compromise on your work on the quality of your work and both of them worked very hard on what they delivered they expected the same from the juniors also and that is one quality which i have tried to imbibe in myself and also tried to pass it on to my colleagues in the chamber at the same time both of them were absolutely family men so they balanced their work with family and that's another quality which i tried to learn and i've also tried to share it with my colleagues in the chamber i couldn't agree more with you something which i always was awestruck by uh, by both of you when you indicated that you have to work hard there is no shortcuts to success but you always and underscored the importance of spending quality time with family so that is something among us juniors we always always noticed because uh, vishal i always feel that people take pride in saying that i don't get time for family but that's not something which you should feel fr- proud of absolutely. you need to find time for family because these moments never come back true no you know many many people lawyers and i think particularly in my age group they used to be proud as he rightly said just said oh i don't know which class my son is studying i don't i never agreed with that and i never appreciated i i of course you know as professionals it is hard but you have to still be involved and frankly as lawyers you you get the opportunity of three vacations which you must take with your family, family. you know you should not work in the vacations that's mm-hmm. one principle if you can say gi mehta's chamber fully imbibed in me and i did it from day one yeah. never worked in the holidays you had uh, indicated how uh, while you were working in law firms drafting was one aspect that you were exposed to uh, you have always otherwise also emphasized the importance of drafting in the life of a junior counsel uh, why is it such an important part of practice especially in early days for a junior see because uh, when you are a young lawyer your mind is full of many thoughts so drafting focuses the mind for actual how do you go about it so when you draft say a petition or a plaint you know every aspect and you know what relief you want once you focus at the end of the pleading you work backwards and you get everything in place and mm-hmm. focusing your mind also focuses you on the issues that you are likely to face yes. in the and drafting is the only way you can learn that dr saraf uh, you had mentioned you had a unique thing that you did as a junior when you were in justice chandrachut's chamber in terms of the prayers that you would carve out can you share with share uh, that with us what are the prayers <clears throat> we were all told in a writ petition if after reading the second paragraph of your petition the judge doesn't give you relief then that petition is not worth it so our entire effort used to be that after drafting the petition we used to try and summarize the entire thing in one paragraph as to what is the challenge in the petition and the grounds on which you challenged i really particularly enjoyed drafting because as ravi said that gave you the opportunity to focus and secondly you could write the script which you saw unfold in court i particularly remember one matter which i did with ravi where we lost a matter and uh, he told me that we are in go and draft an appeal today itself so i drafted the appeal and that time you know the memo of appeal used to be carrying a lot of importance the judges used to read that particularly and next morning when we moved the appeal i recollect that the judge came and said the exact thing which i had said in the first part of my appeal Right. and that right. was extremely satisfying so drafting really gives you a chance to you know develop the matter and i one one i would like to sure. add is that this the counsel who's going to argue or the number 2 who's going to 
assist must draft you know right. because if there is a hiatus between the person who's arguing and the person who's drafting then it's not going to come out That's the so person pitch- who's going to argue he knows how he wants to pitch it pitch. it must be so pitched in the pleading so that the judge catches it if he reads it in advance and that's what berain said the satisfaction you get when your pleading is you know the source of the judge's uh, solution it, there's nothing better than that wow. dr saraf you had mentioned uh, in some of your interactions with students earlier that in your second year of practice uh, you had a moment where you thought you would give up can you take us through your initial years and how you came out of uh, that phase Vishal, I think that happened because I expected too much from the profession too soon. I was married by the end of my first year of practice, and uh, there used to be not much work which I used to get, and I used to have a target of earning three hundred rupees every day. <laughs> that is twenty GMs at that, those times, and if I earned three hundred rupees, I used to be a satisfied person. But that also was difficult to come. a uh, plain drafting entail 25 uh, gms that was 375 rupees that also was difficult to come so at some stage i really thought this is not happening i'll not survive and therefore i almost went into a kind of depression and thought that i leave the profession and uh, how i got out of it of course my wife uh, was working that time and getting a salary she supported me and said you take your time i'll i'll take care of things and secondly my father who of course couldn't help me get work but he used to ensure that i go to work every day he used to hmm. make me meditate in the morning with him and he used to make sure that i go to work and that helped me a lot because if you go to work every day if you don't give up and go to work every day somewhere soon that opportunity comes and it did come moving on to uh, the ag office Uh, Mr. Kadam, you were appointed as an Advocate General at the age of forty-seven, one of the youngest uh, AGs, and you held that position for a long time till two thousand twelve. How was private practice different from the stint that you had as an Advocate General? Mm, private practice, you know, it's you're all really focused on the result, and it's to win the matter is the only object. when you are advocate general you have of course you, you have to deliver results for the government in the important cases but there's a lot of work in the ag's office which uh, i'm sure now dr saraf must be finding which is advisory also somewhere you know some cases where you get an opportunity to much more than just argue a matter and win cases so the ag office has a lot of things which you can do and which are fulfilling both professionally in terms of you know challenging cases you do challenging opinion work you do i remember when one of the opinions which i had to do was that uh, in maharashtra in i think in 2007 or 8 there were forest guards who were not recruited in the regular manner and uh, uma devi's judgment which uh, was their uh, supreme court judgment in uma devi it said that however long they have been in service if the recruitment is not by following the rules etc then you know you can't make them permanent and uh, there were about a large number of forest guards who had not been recruited permanently and who had this problem and we were looking for a solution and one judgment came from uh, justice kadju which went against the entire trend of judgments and he showed us the way and then i wrote to opinion you know to get those guys permanent jobs which gave me great satisfaction and then later on that to my opinion it the matter was challenged in court and the court said that this is different from uma devi for the same reasons that i said and that gives you great satisfaction i'm sure dr saraf will i don't know how many experiences yet but i'm sure he'll have those as he goes right. by early in your career as an advocate general the city faced the deluge on 26 july there was a litany of uh, pils that were filed essentially the bench also had many questions to ask of the state uh, mm-hmm. what was your approach and how did you handle that situation what was the thought process behind answering the queries that fell from the court see the advocate general when he represents the government he also has a kind of 
public approach, namely that public uh, interest should be protected. Unfortunately, I think this in all cities, but definitely in Bombay, I found then and I still find that people think that PILs filed in the High Court are a cure to, you know, problems which are problems of government, governance, which involve complicated questions which courts and judges and lawyers cannot solve. So I realized that and I was fortunate that the first time round, the then Chief Justice, Chief Justice Bandari, uh, as he then was, uh, Dalvir Bandari, he, he realized it and he had a hands-off approach. The 2611, there were again a spate of PILs and people thought that they would, uh, the High Court should intervene in the process of governance mm-hmm. and form committees to advise the government how to enhance security, etc., which I thought was wrong and I opposed all those PILs because I thought that you know, even if the government had failed, it had failed for various reasons. And it was beyond the court or any lay citizens through PIL to correct that. It had mm-hmm. to be corrected at the government level by the government. And committees formed by courts was not the solution. So, Bombay High Court did form a committee. We challenged it and got it stayed in the Supreme Court. Dr. Saraf, on 17 December 2022, you were appointed as the Advocate General of State of Maharashtra. Uh, can you tell us what was going on your going in your mind when you were intimated that you would be taking uh, charge as the AG of the state? By nature, I don't feel too elated about any achievement of mine. It's been my nature. I'm, I Ravi knows that I've always yeah. been a little penal on myself. So it was not a feeling of elation. But at the same time, I was conscious that I'm going to occupy a position which has been held by legendary lawyers, by stalwarts of the bar. And there was, of course, a sense of apprehension as to whether I'll be able to live up to that expectation. And however, at the same time, I was committed to put in my best, which I continue to do. How has been your experience as an advocate general so far? I would say intellectually, it's very, very satisfying because you get a wide range of work to do. The nature of subjects, the nature of law that you get to know and learn is immense. And every day you go back home thinking that, yes, I've learned something new. And that is extremely satisfying. Equally, you learn a lot about governance as to how the government functions, what are the difficulties which the government faces in implementing a lot of things. And lastly, you also get an opportunity where you can do a lot of good for the society, where there are matters or even otherwise, as Ravi said, opinion related work where you can take a very constructive approach and also impress upon the government that if this is done, it will do well to, for the society. And I've often seen that when you put it that way, most of the people in the government accept it. Dr. Saraf, you have also been uh, a part of the Bombay Bar Association. You were honorary secretary for six years. Uh, you were the vice president till your appointment as the AG, wherein you brought in several measures, several uh, projects which really changed so many things in the association. Uh, How was your experience as office bearer of the BBA? That was a wonderful experience. I worked as a secretary when Dr. Sate was the president and Mr. Nitin Thakkar was the vice president. And I learned a lot while I was the secretary of the Bombay Bar Association. And we did a whole lot of work starting with the bar room, which when we took over was quite run down, starting from the renovation of that bar room. I think we overhauled the bar association. We found that the bar association was being quite inactive at that time. And we started a lot of activities. We started a continuing legal education program for lawyers, where every month we used to hold seminars, inviting judges, inviting lawyers. We created a new website, We uh, held the 125 year event of the Bombay Bar Association. But more than that, from the uh, contribution made by senior advocates in that for that 125 year event, we spent only a part of it. And the remaining we used as a corpus with which we formed the Bombay Bar Association Trust. And you will be aware that we utilize that, uh, uh, that trust money to help lawyers for medical needs. We help lawyers or even young uh, students 
for study abroad or for pursuing their studies. So that was a very satisfying experience. Moving on to the final question, uh, if you have any advice you would want to give to a young lawyer who has just joined the bar, what would that be? Most important thing is to hang in, you know, because we feel, and I used to feel for many years, in the first 10, 12, 13, 14 years, that I wasn't getting on or getting ahead or whatever. And there was a great deal of frustration which we all, young lawyers who don't have sufficient work, go through. But actually, you know, you feel you're not progressing, you're just static. But you are, you know, you're getting right. to be a better lawyer, you are doing better. But it, the difference is not perceptible till one day you make a big jump. So it's it's something that, you know, you have to realize that if you hang in and a little bit of luck, you know, you're all going to really be very, very successful. But the important thing is to just stay focused and hang in, hang in there. and not give up. Right. Yes. Dr. Saraf? I, first of all, I fully agree with Ravi that the only way to be successful in the legal profession is not to give up. You Each one of us has faced struggle and all the young lawyers are also going to face the same struggle. The thing is just to keep going. The second thing which I would say is please do not chase money with your profession. If you work hard, this profession will compensate you more than enough. Thirdly, I would say don't compare yourself with others. The day you start comparing yourself with others, you will compromise yourself. So create your own path, create your own set of values and just follow that without comparing yourself with anyone else. And the last thing I would like to tell them is, however successful you become, please do not forget your humility and your empathy. Because it is only if you have these two qualities that you will be able to be a lawyer who will be able to make a constructive contribution to the society at large. Thank you so much, both Mr. Kadam and Dr. Saraf. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to Thank be a you. part of this podcast Thank with you. both of Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. For Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. As emphasized by both Mr. Ravi Kadam and Dr. Saraf, developing a work-life balance is underrated and yet an essential part of any young professional's career, especially one who wishes to build a successful legal practice. You just watched an episode of the Bombay Bar Association podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to enjoy more such videos. We also have an audio podcast which dives a bit deeper and is available on all podcast apps.